Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A very good day to you wherever you are. Maybe you're watching us across the lands and over the beautiful seas. Welcome to Life Matters. In this edition of the health show of Life Matters, in part two in our new series, we're covering female health. So health is definitely something, health and well-being rather, um, is something that is a very important aspect in all of our lives. And in the series, we're delving into the unique health concerns and challenges that women face, from hormonal imbalances to reproductive health and beyond. Joining me online from KZN today is Dr. Fozia Hai, a physician with special interest in women's health and wellness. Together, we'll be exploring PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, hypertension, and also the new craze of IV therapy, IV drip therapy, debunking any common myths, misconceptions, and sharing some practical tips and strategies for optimal health. So let's get started on the show on this journey to empower women and their wellness. Don't forget to interact with us via our WhatsApp line if you have any comments, questions, and queries, because this is just part two of the Women's Health Show. Please WhatsApp us, and there's also an email available. Send your um, comments and any queries or questions. We love how you make the show. Maybe your suggestion could make, uh, make great value in the next content, contents of our next female series, female health series, for the next few couple of shows. So please keep them coming. And I know if you discussed with some auntie and she didn't send an email or WhatsApp, send us, uh, send her our WhatsApp number so she can communicate with us. So let's introduce uh, Dr. Fozia Hai. She's online with us. Assalamu alaikum to you, Doc. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for having me. Only a pleasure. I was waiting quite a quite a long time to have you, and Alhamdulillah, we appreciate the time. So, Dr. Fozia, just to give our viewers a little bit of an introduction, tell us a bit about yourself and um, the speciality you do delve into. So, I am a general practitioner, studied MBPHP degree from the University of Victoria. I've been in general practice now having a wellness center that focuses on women's health as well as wellness for women regarding IV therapy as well as aesthetics. And um, as we're going to discuss common finding that I see a lot is polycystic ovaries and dwelling into high blood pressure and focusing a bit on IV therapy. To touch on the last topic that we have had and just like you're looking at some of the comments and speaking about this topic to others, it was uh, menorrhagia, which is actually quite common. It didn't realize how common it is, and that's excessive bleeding for women during their period and sometimes even after their menstrual cycle. So I just want to touch on that, and if you could just give advice on that quickly, because leaving with the show where we did, and, and it was a great show with Dr. Raisa Abu Baker, um, there was some just um, some feedback with regards to that, because some women don't just having the conversation and say, oh, I'm a heavy bleeder. Yes, my menstrual cycle is quite heavy the first three days, or no, it's throughout the seven days. Women are actually not realizing that that is of concern. So if you could just just touch on that briefly, um, just to latch onto the last show. Definitely. I would urge all females, please pay attention to the number of times that you have to change your menstrual uh, pad. If it's two hours or less, yes, you are having heavy bleeding. If you are passing a lot of cloth, that is also a concern. So the best option for you is to go to your nearest healthcare provider or your obstetrician and gynecologist. As this, in the long run, if we're going to leave this, it's going to lead to anemia, acute blood loss, and you're going to start feeling exhausted. And you may even collapse because your blood levels have dropped to that point. So we tend to ignore the heavy bleeding and feel that it's a normal trait until we reach that point of collapse. And then we seek medical attention. And then it's all emergency care required. You'll need a blood transfusion for the investigations done to see the cause and to attend to the cause. So let's find the cause early to prevent us from getting to that point. Okay. So you run a female wellness center, and that's something that women always, you know, try to branch out to when it comes to looking after themselves. Let's talk about the importance of women's health. It is very important. We fail to realize that there's so many screening tests that are compulsory, but we think it's just mandate, like, oh, I don't really need to do a pap smear. 
or oh, what's a mammogram? I have no issues, but there are certain times in our life that we should be doing these things regarding our health, whether there is a family history, whether there isn't a family history. Once you've reached a certain point, if you're married or sexually active, pap smears are very important because we are missing a lot of the cervical cancer. Early picked up, we can treat it. Same, once you reach the age of 40, it's compulsory that you do a mammogram. But us as women, we don't take it seriously and we just let things pass. Because even with breast cancer, if picked up early, it's curable. So we tend to lack and leave these things, as well as osteoporosis is something that's so common with us as women. As we birth kids, our calcium are depleted. And as time passes, our bones do become brittle. So at the point of age 55 or 60, you can do a bone density scan that can help check for osteoporosis. So there's a lot regarding women's health that we really take for advantage. We don't really pay much attention to it. So let's listen to the doctor. And uh, today we are focusing on uh, PCOS, polycystic uh, ovary syndrome, ovarian syndrome, as well as hypertension. It's actually a highlight of discussion for the month of May, on the, I noticed on the national calendar. Um, and then, of course, uh, Dr. Fosia's interest in IV therapy. So, Doc, let's, let's talk about PCOS. Um, it is, it's actually scaringly common in young girls um, and in women today, not something that we actually heard about, you know, commonly 20, 30 years ago. Let's just okay. on this topic um, to create the awareness. What exactly is it? Um, why is it so common, firstly? Unfortunately, when I have to tell you why, we still don't know. If we have to find a cause, we still don't know. The only common that we can find in the genetic line. So if someone, and polycystic ovarian syndrome has been there for ages. So if someone in the genetic line had it, you will have it. And what basically polycystic, as the name says it, it sits on your ovaries. And these cysts result in an imbalance in your hormones and also leading to something we call as an ovulation, where you're unable to ovulate. That's one of the symptoms is infertility. But it's not that everyone is infertile. It doesn't mean you can't fall pregnant. Yes, you can still, but you need to get diagnosed and get the appropriate help to reach that point. So unfortunately, cause-wise, Nobody knows the cause, but women do have it and it's picked up with the symptoms that they present with. Like sometimes a woman can be putting on weight for no reason and we don't understand it. And we sometimes just leave it like, oh, maybe I am just like this. But there's a reason for it. Um, if you have excessive hair growth, you, a woman can be like, I am just very hairy on my face and my arms and legs, but it's not normal. It needs to be investigated. Uh, your menstrual cycle. Some ladies may have heavy bleeding, irregular patterns of their cycle. Some may not even bleed at all. The irregularities in your menstruation is an alarming sign. I need to check this up. So, Symptoms? so yeah. Continue. Even the face. Something similar as acne mm. or oily skin is a sign of polycystic ovary. But just needing to get to a doctor and do your appropriate testing to diagnose. I think let's just take a quick break and get into, because there's now many questions I have with regards to PCOS. Um, you know, many myths and misconceptions around it, how it affects women's health and their well-being. Um, and then we can look into some treatments around that. But uh, online, don't forget, we want your interaction online. I have uh, Dr. Fozia Hai, who is a general practitioner specializing in women's health, as well as running a women's uh, wellness center. And we're going to discuss PCOS, hypertension, and IV therapy more just after the short break. Stay with us.
welcome back as we cover our female health series on Life Matters Health in this edition. And don't forget to tell your family and friends that if they've missed any of the shows, they can also catch it on our YouTube channel. So online, I have Dr. Fozia, hi, a physician with special interest in women's health and wellness and runs our own women's wellness center out in Durban. So Dr. Hyde, just to, um, just to recap quickly, you've mentioned some of the symptoms um, as well as, you know, why, um, you know, some of the causes of, um, you know, PCOS, um, why it exists. You mentioned the, the, the genetics that does play a role. Uh, are there any environmental factors that exist that could possibly influence the, the offset of PCOS? I wouldn't say influence it, but yes, aggravate it. Um, we have our lifestyle, our diet, our people don't realize it, that what the imbalance of the hormones is doing inside and how that is affecting. All that does play a role, but really in causing it, no, I wouldn't say any environmental factors. So just to run through the symptoms again, um, you've mentioned... Um, Hairy, very the hairiness, that was some of the ones. Um, could you just reiterate um, those symptoms? So a lot of facial hair, like excessive growth, their hair would be very thick and coarse on their face, as well as on the rest of their body. You find a lot of excessive hair growth, which is not a normal trait. And then as I explained, the periods, the menstrual cycles will not be regular. It will be irregular or even absent. Um, some of them may experience uh, even hair loss, but that is only in the scalp area, balding. And weight gain is a common trait that we find the polycystic ovaries because if, um, most of them are insulin resistant. And also, as I explained, infertility is one of them. Um, it can lead to infertility, but not everyone will be infertile. And as well as the oily skin and acne, it just doesn't resolve and it's because of that hormonal imbalance. So besides the symptoms, what are the effects of um, having PCOS? So the effects of it is you're having insulin resistance, you are gaining your weight, you, if you're not diagnosing this and starting your correct management for it, you are risking yourself to develop diabetes mellitus, to develop high blood pressure, all of these are predisposition of uncontrolled polycystic ovaries because of the imbalance in your hormones. So I just like to dwell into how we diagnose it because sometimes people will be like, how do you know? How do I know that I have polycystic ovaries? Um, so there's three factors we look at. And if you have any of the two, then we diagnose as polycystic ovaries. As we explain the signs, the common symptoms, if you are experiencing these symptoms as displayed here, that's one point. As long as your healthcare professional has excluded all the other causes and everything else is coming back normal, then that's one point. Second point, you're presenting with a heavy period or irregular period or absent period. Now we investigate. We've looked at every other option and all the other options are clear. Then that's the second point. Third point is when we do a scan and we look at your ovaries in the scan and we see the cysts on the ovaries. It can either be just on the one side or it can be on both sides, left and right, that confirms you have polycystic ovaries. And then the next step the doctor will do is do blood tests for you. So we check your hormone levels. Your hormone levels, we do your testosterone level. We do your estrogen, progesterone. We also do LH, which is a luteinizing hormone. And from our pituitary gland in our brain, that plays a role in production of the latter hormones as well as plays a role in ovulation. So those levels tell us it will be raised or depleted, certain hormones, and then we know, okay, you are in the category of having polycystic ovarian syndrome. And take the next step in how we're going to go ahead in managing this. Okay. Is, is there any latest research or advancements in PCOS diagnosis um, that, you know, people can be aware of and actually ask for when they are visiting the, treat, uh, the, visiting the doctor, you know, when being diagnosed and also possibly within the, the treatment, um, any latest research and advancement? So latest research and advancements, I won't say it will be latest because they reiterate what we've always known. But as I said, PCOS was not picked up as often as we are picking up now. 
And they stress them running exactly the same things as they've always been saying when they diagnose with PCOS. Whether it comes to your lifestyle change, whether it comes to incorporating certain medications, whether it's regulating your cycle, it's all these steps and measures taken to prevent the latter outcome of you developing further ailments like diabetes, monitors, high blood pressure, increasing your cholesterol levels. You can be having polycystic ovaries, not even knowing that your cholesterol is sitting at 9 and 10. That's one of the common features of it. So a lot of risk factors are involved with PCOS. And that's where the latest developments are less diagnosed so we can prevent. Okay, so common myths and misconceptions that possibly present when it does come to PCOS. So yes, they are myths. Yeah. Um, a lot of people, we in the community, we in society, I read up like you did something to get PCOS. Nobody does anything to get PCOS. As I say, it's a genetic line. Sometimes you don't realize maybe your sister, you have siblings, they are fine. Why do I have it? It's just unfortunate. And there's nothing wrong with you or something you've done to cause it. It's from the genetic line. That is why you have it. But it doesn't even mean it's the end of the world. Another myth is um, a lot of people say, oh, if you lose weight, you get cured of PCOS. Unfortunately, there is no cure to eliminate PCOS, but we do work around the symptoms to make them less and make those cysts less around your ovaries to make you be back to normal as much as we can. So losing weight does play a big role, but it doesn't mean it's going to cure completely. And also the infertility aspect is the myth that everyone is infertile. No, there are modalities. If uh, a lot of people start with lifestyle, lifestyle modification, start with losing the weight, with some resistance training exercises, with incorporating, uh, if they have insulin resistance, we start them on metformin. And once they start losing the weight, the cysts actually start to melt. And this will aid in them to even ovulate. And naturally, yes, they can fall pregnant. And if the natural process doesn't work, IVF also does work with polycystic ovarian syndrome. So it's not that you will never fall pregnant. That's a huge myth that everyone thinks, I have PCOS, I'll never have kids. I know many patients with PCOS that have two to three kids. So that myth needs to go away. So are there lifestyle changes that somebody, the woman or the lady, the young lady needs to make when she's been diagnosed with PCOS? Yes. That's like a big chunk of PCOS. Lifestyle mm. changes as in what we eat. Unfortunately, with PCOS, the estrogen levels are quite high. You are insulin resistant. So if we can eat a lot of carbohydrates, we don't store it in energy, we convert it to fat. We're going to keep, keep increasing our weight. So with the diet plan for PCOS, we need rich protein diet, which will keep you fuller, which works well on your body, as well as low carbohydrates and your healthy fat. You don't want to have your basic chunk to be carbohydrates. It's not going to help you treat the PCOS. You want it to be your protein, which is found in, if you're a vegetarian, it's your lentils, your greens, your broccoli. But if you're not a vegetarian, your fish, your chicken, all that helps. So diet does play an important role in PCOS because diet itself can bring almost 60 to 70% of control if you maintain it. Uh, a lot of people suggest having green tea. A lot of people suggest having spearmint tea that also works. Incorporate it in your life. It doesn't mean the end of the world. It doesn't mean that, oh, I cannot have any form of carbohydrate. You can, but in moderation, but increasing your protein intake at the same time with your good fat will help. Look at women's uh, overall health and well-being when it comes to PCOS because of course it's got to do with hormones and the imbalances and, and because of what's happening to the ovaries. Um, often people don't realize that there's a, um, there's, there's a psychological effect to every illness. So how can they manage that, uh, Dr. High? So a lot of anxiety is seen with PCOS, a lot of depression is seen with PCOS and a lot of body dysmorphic disorder where I'm not happy with my body. I'm not happy whether it's the excessive hair. I'm not happy with the weight gain. And in case you're in weight gain, is not just focused 
uh, it's not very symmetrical. You know, you have weight gain where you're going to be just belly fat or it'll just be on your hips and it makes your body uh, structure very uh, not pleasing to the eye. And that's why it leads to a lot of females getting into depression and not happy. And this leads to even social phobia because now they don't like to step out into the social environment. But it's just to encourage them, seek help. Get to your doctor. We get you help regarding the PCOS. We get you help regarding the mental state that it leads to. And once you see the results are immaculate, once you see you start losing the weight, you feel better. Um, a common finding of PCOS, which a lot of females don't talk about, is constipation and bloating. Um, and that really also leads a lot of anxiety and depression in them. But once you start your lifestyle change, incorporated with your medication, there's no more bloating. You are going out well. It just makes you feel happier within and out. So I just would like to encourage all women to just seek the help. After the next break, we'll touch on hypertension and how it does affect women's health with uh, Dr. Fozia. Hi, your interaction is absolutely necessary. So send us a WhatsApp line, WhatsApp message uh, for your comments on women's health and follow the series on our YouTube channel as well. Stay with us. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. Thank you so much for joining us and staying with us in this Women's Health Series on Life Matters with the Dr. Fozia High Women's Wellness Doctor um, out in KZN. And now I'd like to touch on hypertension. So Dr. High, let's look at, um, you know, high blood pressure in women, the risk, the symptoms, and some of the consequences that does involve having hypertension. So high blood pressure also something very important that we seem to ignore and neglect as females. A lot of times I see females, their blood pressure is high and they're like, oh, I'm maybe just stressed. Oh, I'm having some headache and it's nothing serious, doctor, but we ignore it. High blood pressure is very prominent in women. It's also one of the leading causes of cardiovascular disease that is coming to your heart and leading cause of the death related to cardiovascular disease, your high blood pressure. What's the common finding they've noticed is women of menopausal age, that's why studies have shown that women from 60 to 65 are more prone to get high blood pressure because their estrogen levels are low now. When they reach menopause, that they can be diagnosed with high blood pressure. But other risk factors are if you're a smoking person, it's an increased risk of you for high blood pressure. If you have a genetic line, your first line, whether it's your mom, dad, or grandparents, or aunt, uncle, from your dad's side, it's a risk factor already. And also a risk, they say, is if you have a parent that passed with a heart attack at a younger age, um, it's a major risk that you will develop this. And it's important for you to keep monitoring and checking with your healthcare professional that you do have high blood pressure or not. And it's usually diagnosed by taking the reading, but symptoms that you ignore is having recurrent headaches. Uh, vision may blur now and then. And nose bleeds is also a trait that people seem to ignore. And you may get short of breath at times. But these are little things that you say, oh, I'm just tired. Oh, I just have a little bleed. Maybe just hot today. Go and get your blood pressure checked. Little things that we ignore, but just thinking towards high blood pressure. And high blood pressure, just not one reading. It's the one reading you take as your healthcare professional and you repeat it in the week. And if you have two confirmed high readings where the normal is 120 over 60 and now it's above that, then we know that you are reaching the category of high blood pressure. So then we can start considering starting to treat you. And now we have a um, great modality where it's called a 24-hour reading, which we connect to you. You go home, you keep reading your blood pressure, you come back in 24 hours, and then we see what the BP like throughout the 24 hours. And then we can see how many times it has spiked. And then we diagnose high blood pressure. Okay. So um, looking at uh, who this usually affects, um, we have uh, a concern during a pregnancy uh, time when it comes to high blood pressure. 
And then uh, some women also say that it's, you know, all of a sudden um, existed in menopause. So let's look at those women that um, the high, high blood pressure does affect. Pregnancy is very important. That is why it has been noted whether it's a government facility or the private facility, the first thing checked at every visit when you are pregnant is your blood pressure. Because high blood pressure in pregnancy is worrying. If not treated, it leads to severe complications that can affect both mom and the baby. And complications that can even lead to death. So high blood pressure is very, very detrimental when confirmed in pregnancy. You can be a a well person, fall pregnant and get diagnosed with BP. You don't have to have high blood pressure to have high blood pressure in pregnancy. And it so happens that even uh, you get diagnosed during the pregnancy, but after the pregnancy, it goes away. That's also a possibility. It was just a high blood pressure in pregnancy that you had. But I, do, I want to stress on all the women out there, please check your blood pressures and do your normal monthly antenatal checkups and once the doctor picks it up they start you on the treatment and they monitor you very closely so once they say a pregnant woman has high blood pressure she becomes a high risk pregnancy and closely monitored throughout that journey of her pregnancy and if that is done correctly you will be fine so moving on to menopause yes sorry sorry <laughs> I'm looking at managing already. Yeah, mention, yeah, mention men menopause, please. Uh, menopause, as I say, when we reach the menopausal phase in our lives, our hormone levels are now depleting, which actually increases us with the risk of getting high blood pressure. So some of the symptoms may mimic, you may say, oh, it's just I'm going through menopause now. That's why I'm feeling like this. But it's the BP that's going up. Ex example, headaches. Um, the shortness of it, which can be linked to the hot flushes that comes about with menopause. And many women misconstrue it to menopause, but it's actually menopause is leading you to get high blood pressure. So it's a very important thing to check because now we're reaching a point, we are menopausal, we have high blood pressure, and high blood pressure has its consequences too. We call them target organ damage. Okay. If we don't sit up, we don't treat the high blood pressure, it's going to affect everything, starting from the top. If I go to your brain, you can get vasculitis, you can get dementia, you can get a stroke. Moving down, if I come to your eyes, you can get glaucoma because it's pressure increase in your eye, leading to blindness. Moving down, we go to your heart, it's going to give you a heart attack if we don't pick up the high blood pressure. Moving down, if I go to your kidneys, we can lead to kidney failure and we don't even know because we didn't pick up the high blood pressure. So it's very important. Okay, so now you need to advise those that uh, is possibly at risk or that has high blood pressure, how they can manage and control it. So we all know of medication. Medication, a lot of people come to me, but doctor, I take my medication, but it's not to be it all. Medications are there to help you, but lifestyle changes are also there that we need to do to help bring the CP down. Our diet, Reduce the salt intake. It has an impact on the high blood pressure. Eating a healthy diet, incorporating exercise. I'm not saying vigorous exercise, hitting the gym. Our studies have shown if you do at least three to four times in the week, brisk walking for 20 minutes reduces your cardiovascular risk. Um, if you're a smoker, encourage them to stop smoking or find other alternatives to like cut it down because this is further increasing your risk for that vessel close to your heart to narrow, to your brain to narrow, leading to a stroke or a heart attack. And something else which we also ignore is stress. It's easy to say manage the stress, but it's important as well because when you are stressed out, it can also push that BP very high. So a lot of things to play around as well as medications are very important, but it's the holistic care that is required and not just medications. So, yes, we want to talk about, you know, IV therapy and the drip, um, you know, this wonderful drip that everybody's been uh, craving or uh, crazing about. But I also, and, and as much as, you know, treatment is out there and we, we need to take control of our condition, our environment, how can family, friends, community, and even our close loved ones in our homes play a role in helping women manage whether they have PCOS or hypertension? Oh. Uh. 
um, with polycystic ovaries, it's just encourage, encourage our women also to seek the help because there is stigma against it. I feel if someone is overweight as a community, you don't seem to think there could be a problem here. Mm. We don't allow the person to seek the help because of the stigma related. If it's infertility, it's regarded as, oh, there's something wrong, but not really finding out that maybe there is, but it needs medical help and it can be sorted out if you seek the help. With high blood pressure, I think we commonly think of only men have high blood pressure. You know, women also suffer from high blood pressure. And it's encouraging our people in the community. We have clinics around, we have hospitals around, we have doctors around. Go and just do a routine checkup. Even if it, once you've reached the point, um, I don't want to age it because people say I'm still young, but let's just say 40. Mm. You're well, you're there's no family history, but let's just go. Let's go get an annual checkup done. Let's do our routine blood. Let's check our sugar. Let's check our BP. So we know you do it once a year even. You are checking yourself up as women. We're doing it once a year. We're checking. We're going, speaking about our menstruation, speaking about how, all the symptoms we're having. Something like hair growth, you think, oh, it's nothing. Maybe I'll just go to the beauty sense. But no, there's mm. a medical cause for Let's speak about it more. And let's go and just do routine checkup. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Fozia Hai, because like you said earlier on, it's a holistic approach and that includes the people that's around you. I want to take a short break and come back now with, I think what I've been waiting for the most is IV therapy. What is the latest craze about it? What exactly is it and how does it help you with various conditions, even those that we mentioned, PCOS and hypertension, overall women's health. But more after the short break, don't forget you can interact with us with your comments and questions. Use that WhatsApp line because we want to hear from you back in a moment. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome back. A very good day to you, uh, wherever you are. Uh, please note that any of the shows that you have missed, you can catch it on our YouTube channel, Hilal TV Life Matters. But in this health edition, reiterating the, the female women's series that we're having, the health series for women, um, this is just part two of it, alhamdulillah. Um, last we have uh, Dr. Raisa Abu a very important topic, amenorrhagia, which is heavy bleeding for females during the menstru menstrual cycles as well as outside of the menstrual cycle. So please um, encourage girls, ladies, if ever you do hear that they have any heavy bleedings, that they need to go and see, um, you know, doctor. And as Dr. Um, Fozia mentioned earlier in the show, it is uh, having to change your uh, menstrual pads every two hours. So uh, throughout that seven days of your period or however long you, you usually have it. So Dr. Fozia, I want to touch on now uh, the exciting part of the show, and that is IV drip therapy. Uh, what exactly is IV therapy? And um, just uh, explain how it works um, when it comes to, you know, when, when a patient, whether, whether she comes in, um, you know, deciding on having it, because of course we know it's a, a needle, like putting a drip on, on your arm, and then also some of the benefits, inshallah. So IV drip therapy, we call it IV nutrient therapy. Okay. Why the word nutrient? Because basically we're putting in the elements within our body that with time are depleted with exposure to our environment, with our diet, with our lifestyle. We start lacking a lot of our nutrients. And with the current environment we are in, we are not really getting all of this through our diet itself. So IV nutrient therapy is a form of putting in via the IV these nutrients in your vein in high doses, which is safe, which enhances every cell in your body, every organ in your body. You're going to feel an energy boost. You will feel your immune system get stronger. It helps in reducing inflammation. It helps with pain management. It has so many benefits. And what's good about it is that we're not putting anything recreational inside. We're putting everything that's in our body, but just with time has really gone to So let's talk about, um, you know, besides it helping in the various aspects, um, instead of popping your daily vitamin pill, the actual nutrient, uh, nutrient benefits it has, what 
other benefits does it have with regards to overall health? Um, and, and, and those having a busy lifestyle, who is it for IV drip therapy? So it's recommended 18 years and above okay. for everybody. We just exclude our pregnant women and our breastfeeding women. After that phase has passed, they are safe to have it. Whether a patient has any ailments 18 years and above, whether it's COS, high blood pressure, diabetes, any other lupus or any other chronic conditions, it is actually beneficial because it enhances the effects of your medication. If someone with an autoimmune disease, your immunity is low. Someone with cancer, your immunity is low. So it boosts your immunity and that's preventing you from picking up infections. A normal healthy person, it will boost your immunity so you don't pick up infections as often. And it improves your performance, whether it's at work, whether it's at the gym, or whether it's a sport activity. And you get many different types of these nutrient drips. You have the immune booster drip. Then you will also get a gut health. You get a detox drip, a weight loss drip, which are using all these nutrients and not anything out of the ordinary. And you also have your uh, brain and mood boosters that will have people that are always feeling low or feeling that, especially our university kids, that it's a bit too much to absorb. It helps them in the performance. And it's all safe and it's all good. Okay. That was my next question. Is it safe? So knowing that it is safe, how often uh, do people come for it? Do you need it? Um, how long does it stay in your system? And what is that exactly is in the, the nutrient drip that is being put in your arm? So uh, every individual to itself. Mm -hmm. If you are someone exhausted quite a bit or secondary to anemia, you may need a nutrient IV boost every two weeks until we reach the point of you needing it monthly. If you're a fairly, fairly well person, you're not that depleted on a monthly basis, we recommend that you get the IV drip. What's in it is your vitamin C, which is so important for us. Now, we can give it at as high as 5,000 to 25,000 entries in space. Mm -hmm. We have your magnesium in there, your vitamin B, coal, B12 in there, as well as an element which many people misconstrue it for other reasons. I will say it now is glutathione. I know a lot of people relate glutathione to skin and a glow drip, but it's actually an element of our body mm -hmm. that is depleted with sun exposure, recurrent viral infections, and your vitamin C works in hand with glutathione within our body to give it that result that we need to build your immunity, to help all the cells in your body, as well as to give skin is an organ. I always explain this to patients that your skin is also an organ, so you mm -hmm. get the benefit of your skin as well. But we need vitamin C and glutathione together. To have that result. And the other uh, fear of it is, oh, it's a drip. But we use the smallest of needles. And if you think of it, orally, the studies have shown, shown that taking supplements orally, the absorption is like less than 0.001%. Okay. But via an IV drip, your absorption is up to 60% of mm -hmm. the nutrients. So the results are immediate. Like within the next day, you will start feeling the energy levels up and feeling better and take your day on better. Um, the other fear that people have is, um, it's, you know, always being poked and it's going in. So I just like to think in a simpler form, what is our vein? Our vein is actually something that draws blood from our body, takes it to the right side of our heart, gets oxygenated blood, then through the lip and pumps blood to every organ in our body. So you can imagine these vitamins going to every organ in your body, and that's what's going to help you. Whether if it's a high blood pressure patient or a diabetic patient, you're going to see better control in your BP, a better control in your diabetes. You're going to feel more energetic. It will at least push you to do a bit more of your exercise because it will benefit you in a lot of ways. Mm. I've seen excellent results with people, people coming back on a monthly basis and actually improving in a lot of factors if they are having their underlying conditions. So it's safe and it is recommended. It's nothing recreational, so don't be scared of it. Okay, so we've discussed uh, PCOS and um, hypertension, high blood pressure. How can IV drip therapy, nutrient therapy help those suffering from PCOS, hypertension, and also overall women's health? So, example, like we, when I say a weight loss drip, many of you always just one of those that, you know, 
people are advertising, but in the nutrient weight loss stuff, we are actually putting elements that's going to benefit you in that what happens with PCOS, we get something that's called, um, it, it, if you ask someone with PCOS, when you come to the actual meal, they will eat a very small portion. But if when it comes to binge eating, where there is all the unhealthy things, they can go on at a, at a pace that a normal person cannot, and they cannot explain it why. Mm. So what this does, it actually works on your brain centers to once you've eaten your meal, if you're full, and also reduce your appetite that you have, that really benefits someone suffering with PCOS. Because there's no mindful eating with PCOS, and it's out of their control because of the imbalance that they have. Mm. So that's one benefit that patients with PCOS will feel. Uh, when it comes to someone with high blood pressure, as I say, the immune booster, and we also have a cardiac health step, will also help you because they have elements like ALA, which is also an element of our body mm. that protects patients with high blood pressure and protect them from that complication of the cardiac that we have, the heart attacks and stuff. But I also always stress on my patients, this is a very good added benefit, but holistic care, as we discussed, lifestyle, diet, medication, and we're going to add the IV drip, and you're going to be at the top of the range of managing your illnesses really well. And let's not say illness, it's been, you're going to live a healthy, normal lifestyle, just you're managing what you've been diagnosed with better. So if you're doing that IV therapy, because now you mentioned the others as well, what happens in the cases where people are just thinking of IV therapy as an ultimate solution? So they're not doing the lifestyle changes, they're not making the um, dietary changes, or even you know lessening the stress or the burdens that they have. Um, what happens to those individuals in those cases? It's not going to be beneficial. For example, you come to me, you've taken your weight loss trip, and then you mm. cannot go, my appetite is this, but I'm eating a high carb. I go to a franchise and I buy a meal and I'm eating it. It's not going to benefit. Mm. It, it's a holistic way. Lifestyle changes, diet changes, incorporating the healthy foods in it, as well as some sort of exercise. Nothing strenuous, and you see good results. So, so it's a complete... Yeah. Just not molding it. I'm taking my IV therapy, so I'm good for everything. Mm. So, Dr. Fozia, if you could please share with us um, some case studies, some success stories, and um, for those that have actually benefited well with uh, IV nutrient drip therapy. I've actually had quite a few IV neuro in the month of Ramadan. We've had a lot of people go for Umrah and that mm -hmm. came to take the immune boosters because they were very depleted, they fasting and humid day. A lot of them had chronic ailments and the feedback was amazing. Okay. As people have responded saying there was a lady that responded to us and she says after Umrah it takes her three months because she suffers from arthritis mm. and a lot of other that she doesn't manage after that. But thanks to the trip she could be up and continue with what she needed to do in two days. That's mm. how much of a benefit we had. Then we had another person before, an elderly female, take it before the month of Ramadan. And what a wonderful feedback. She could never complete all her fasts or even pray, um, sitting down properly or even standing. And it helped her in her wow. prayers. It helped her in all her fasts. So it, it does give you that very good energy and immunity boost mm. and energize all your cells that whatever you wish to conquer, you can get there. It's just maintaining it and making sure that it's a holistic care incorporated. You do see good results. I remember back in COVID time, just after I recovered and we were feeling good, but there was still that sluggishness and somebody recommended doing IV drip therapy. And alhamdulillah, we did that. And I'm sure, uh, you know, it, it definitely helped with the recovery, at least uh, from the after post-COVID um, so definitely, I, I mean, in every case, whether you need it just after a possibly heavy day or heavy week or heavy month as a recovery, or to see you through some weight loss. And as you mentioned, it does also have some effects on your skin. Um, there's great benefits for IV drip therapy. Uh, but unfortunately, time has to end now, just as we're having fun, because I have also so much questions, and I'm sure the viewers do as well. Um, just your final comments on the takeaway message and thoughts around women's health and wellness and incorporating, you know, an holistic approach? All I would like to say as a female myself that we are women who are in very busy lifestyles, whether you are in your work environment, whether you're a homemaker, 
we tend to ignore ourselves and we tend to ignore the symptoms we are experiencing. There is a time for us to get certain tests done. Please seek healthcare professionals. In your busy lifestyle, take out time to do your pap smears. Take out time for the general test examination. Take out time to get checked up. We ignore ourselves a lot and it leads to detrimental things later on. So as women, let's eat better lifestyles. Let's help each other. Let's pick up these symptoms. Let's lead a healthier lifestyle. Get together. Instead of us talking, let's talk and walk. Let's mm. walk a bit. <laughs> We can talk and we can walk at the same time. There's so much we can do to make our life better because we have lots of other people to look after. Yeah. And that's the challenge of every woman. So I encourage women out there. Mainly screening is so important. Your pap smears, your mammograms. I cannot mm. stress enough about those two things that we need to focus on that. I see Dr. Um, Dr. Fozia Hai also has a TikTok page and an Instagram um, link as well. So please connect with her if you want to find out some more great advice and guidance. And if you are in the KZN, go and pop her a visit because I would too. Um, inshallah, it was a pleasure having you um, on air with us. Thank you so much for joining us in this episode of Life Matters Health. Um, Dr. Fozia, we really appreciate it. And hopefully we can do a follow-up uh, show again with regards to yes, contents yes. And, and women looking after themselves, inshallah. But all the best till we chat again. Assalamu alaikum to you. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And thank you for having me. Only a pleasure. Do follow our female health series on Life Matters. We hope you find this conversation informative and empowering. Remember, taking care of your health is not just a necessity. It's a celebration of your health. As Dr. Fozia said, reiterate, look at your health in a holistic approach and invest in it wisely. And always remember, empowered women empower other women. Take control of your health and inspire others to do the same. Join us next time on Life Matters in our parenting edition as we chat to human potential expert Nikki Bush and we find out how primary school children are challenged with being addicted to their devices and what they're actually telling her about on this matter. So a very interesting topic to listen to for our next Health Matters show. Until then, always remember that your life matters. Wassalamu alaikum and goodbye.